we'll make a start. So Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Assalamu Alaikum. In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, peace and blessings be upon you all. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar titled Sustainability and Spirituality, brought to you by Muslims in Rail. My name is Akhtar Hussein. I am a system engineer for Network Rail Southern Region and a Muslims in Rail champion, and I will be your host for this afternoon. Our special guest speaker today is Azhar Kayyum, who is director of Q-Sustain and an environmental specialist at Network Rail. Azhar is a highly motivated engineering professional with 20 years of experience within sustainable design and delivery. This is coupled with invaluable experience in practical major program and supply chain management. He has extensive experience in low carbon engineering design, recently working with Network Rail, creating a national standard in air quality. Azhar has helped deliver Network Rail's first BRIAM Very Good rated station at Birmingham New Street and is a guest lecturer at the University of Manchester in Renewable and Clean Technology. Now, before I hand you over to Azhar, some housekeeping. I'd just like to let all participants know that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Muslims in Rail YouTube page. Um, we have set aside a small amount of a, a time for Q&A, so if you can please think of some good questions throughout the webinar and post them using the chat function. Further, you can share your thoughts and comments also using the chat function. So without further ado, I will now hand you over to Azhar. Azhar, over to you. Zakala Khair, thank you for the introduction. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Is that okay up there? Yep, can you loud and clear, mate? Okay, thank you. Jazakallah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Manifest and the Merciful. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to Muslims in Rail um, and to all friends and family that have joined as well and uh, to all our guests, uh, both Muslim and non-Muslim, uh, it's worth pointing out. Uh, so appreciate this, this opportunity to talk to you about quite an, an interesting and increasingly important topic. And one that I feel is quite overlooked, uh, particularly within our communities, but it should actually be the opposite. Um, I know we've got just uh, an hour to go through this and there's quite a few slides um, but basically the following set of slides in this presentation today will include a very short intro about who we are what we do and um, set the scene in respect of climate change which many of us see and hear on the news all the time now and in the press uh, case study related to a low carbon development which after uh, kindly pointed out which is built redevelopment new street station and and some quotes hadith uh, from the ground and the hadith in respect of what we should be seen as the Green Dean, a faith that is should be sustainable uh, from our beliefs and in our practices as well. A bit about what we do. So Q Sustains now in its uh, eighth year now, alhamdulillah. Uh, we've been quite fortunate to be involved in some quite prestigious projects. Uh, New Street being one of them, also HS2. Uh, we're doing lots of schemes with Avanti Rail, previously Virgin Rail in respect of low carbon stations and network rail and first of its kind decarbonization projects and uh, leading in air quality strategy, currently writing a national standard uh, in managing air quality and diesel emissions uh, for network rail stations and depots. One of the big drivers uh, for myself actually in starting Q-Sustain was uh, making sure that if we are going to go into business, uh, we need to have not just a, a, a quest for making profit like everyone wants to, everyone wants to make money and, and have a good livelihood, um, but it's having a, a wider purpose as well. Uh, and I think the combination of two together not only should uh, increase one's uh, faith as well, uh, but also the fact that, you know, we can help, we can help the world because sustainability is not just about uh, green technology, uh, waste materials, uh, water preservation. There's a lot more to it, which I'll explain today. And the other big reason as well, um, is for our future generation's sake is we have to really create the change and we need to be seen as leaders, uh, which I'll explain about shortly as well. One of the big drivers is currently our population is something in the order of 7.9 billion. Um, and by the next nine years, we'll be at eight, eight up to eight and a half billion approximately as was predicted. As hard, I was going to say, you can go full screen if you want, but, but oh, I'm right sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Sorry, I thought I was. <laughs> Apologies. Is that better? Much better. Go for it. Um, so... One of the things that we, with an increasing population, is we're going to need a lot more energy, a lot more water and a lot more food. And in a world where we're actually depleting our resources, this is going to become a lot more challenging. And in many of our projects, um, just conscious that we've got a lot of rail personnel and professionals on, on this uh, talk as well, is looking at the project life cycle. So we have to look at sustainability in terms of energy, materials, water, waste, uh, resource efficiency, right from the get go, right from the concept, going through our specifications, going through our design and how we procure suppliers 
and even looking at the supply chain as well um, to how we build, how we install commission. Um, commission is so important these days as well of how our assets are maintained and managed and operated as well. And then looking at whole life cycle, what will happen at the end of the life of that asset? Can we reuse, can we recycle, or will we end up with materials that can go that end up in landfill for hundreds of years, maybe longer? And one of the challenges at the moment is our planet cannot continue the way we are doing in respect of consumption from humans. The current rate of consumption cannot be carried by the planet. And that's why we have all these shortcuts when it comes to pesticides, herbicides, et cetera, to try to accelerate growth of, of um, our uh, uh, resources and, and how we grow our food and crops, et cetera. Um, and if you're in one of the most richest countries, whether that's the US or Western Europe, we're actually consuming three times the size of planet can really carry by its natural means. Um, and that is something really significant. And this isn't hearsay, this is actual fact. You can, you can read up on this. Um, and what is that creating? Well, there's loads of issues uh, that we see all day, every day on the news. Um, today is World Water Day, um, so quite timely with this presentation. And water itself, uh, I remember you know, nearly 18 years ago in my first professional career with Arab, there were some papers that carried out then to predict that future wars uh, will not just be, will not, won't be over oil like they are these days, but they'll be over water because water will be so scarce. And the diagram shows this in terms of water demand in the future with the red being over 120% demand in these countries um, with a growing population and obviously loss of clean water supplies um, due to exploitation. And currently there's about 4 billion people that are in water stressed areas and that's only going to get worse. And uh, it's, it's really, really becoming an increasingly important issue. And one in four children in areas of extreme, extremely high water stress in meaning that this lack of uh, clean water supplies and climate change is only going to make this matter worse um, so this is something that we really have to be wary of um, and have to look at preservation. And, and I'll come on to the Hadith and quotes uh, later on. Um, but one important one is obviously the Prophet Sallam used to talk about excess water. He himself he used to do wuzu or bath would use minimal amount of water. And there's even quantity stated from bathing in you know, over two and a half litres um, of water to use as minimal water as you can. Um, and even when there's a Sahabi trying to do wuzu in, in the flowing river, uh, it, was, it was seen as excess waste by the Prophet Sallam in, in the made the comment that even if you're on the banks of a river, you need to be mindful about water preservation and not to waste. Um, and that is something that we really have to be uh, mindful of going forward for our future generations. And not just obviously talking about water stress, but, but generally you turn on the news now in the papers. When I started out my career over 20 years ago, I always had a keen interest in sustainable design, particularly in, in, in energy looking at low carbon energy systems um, but now is it is the whole issue around uh, issues around how we're growing our food um, the, the whole climate change issues around melting ice caps rising sea levels um, increase that we see in unpredicted weather patterns uh, yesterday we've seen it on the news australia had the worst floods in 100 years in sydney uh, we've seen more forest fires deforestation and um, we, we're just seeing really unprecedented record-breaking events warmest summers warmest years uh, most adverse uh, flood predictions going on, uh, this, it's all happening. Um, and climate change is playing a key part in the reasons why year on year we are breaking records when it comes to peak temperatures, peak storms, um, and really people suffering more so in the poorer countries, unfortunately. Uh, and this is both at land and sea, because as we are emitting carbon emissions from all our industrial activities and industrial processes, Obviously, that's having a, a massive effect. At the moment, we, we're not even seeing the worst of this because the oceans have been buffering uh, this issue around increasing climate um, due to carbon emissions because they're absorbing a lot of the carbon. But they're now the oceans are, are now being predicted to be seen reaching that optimal point now where they can't even absorb any more carbon and it's altering the balance of the oceans as well, more acidification. We've seen degradations of coral reefs and destruction of, of reef structures. Um, and all this is having a detrimental effect through the food chain. Um, and it really is a massive warning sign as the oceans now start to warm and they can't take any more carbon as well. There's a lot we can do about this we'll talk about, but disaster is really approaching land and sea. And if you look at some of the figures in respect of industrial fishing as well, we're nearly out of fish, fish stocks. You know, there's so much depletion, so much exploration going on that from the 1950s to now, you're only catching a third of what they did um, during that time per kilometre of these fishing fleets travelled. 
And um, so many studies done, this is from University of Western Australia in the US and the UK as well. Many studies around this with, fleet, with depleting fish stocks. And again, that's having massive impacts throughout the food chain in the oceans as well. And then when it comes to consumption, this is something that unfortunately is quite prevalent within our own communities um, in how much we actually consume when it comes to meat and chicken, poultry, dairy. Um, it's significant amounts uh, that we overconsume. And religiously as well, one of the basic concepts of not just making sure that we have halal certified products, but people have completely forgotten the whole concept around dayab as well. This is pure wholesome foods. And again, there's many, there's many references in Hadith and Quran about eating wholesome foods. Um, and, and doing that, obviously, we, we create a more sustainable environment. But the demand is such now that so many shortcuts are taking place when it comes to both halal certified foods as well. And the energy and carbon associated with this is, is on a magnificent scale. Um, if, if you look at some of the figures around, you know, using 12,000 gallons of water and up to nine kilograms of grain to produce a single pound of meat, that's, that is significant. And some other facts around this is for every person, there are three, uh, there, there, there's three uh, chickens um, in, the, in the world at the moment and meat and dairy account for around 14 and a half percent of global greenhouse gas emissions significant a proportion that's from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization figures and unfortunately our, some of our communities are one of the highest consumers when it comes to meat and chicken um, and that's something that's creating not just obviously impacts on our climate um, and, and our world but also on health as well massive increases in diabetes and heart disease and um, due to fat building up within our arteries from people you know kids at young age eating out what they call obviously the fast food generation um, something that is closely linked with sustainability and something that if we change will not only help the world but will also help uh, our health and uh, to have a healthy lifestyle as well. And then in terms of animals and welfare, there's so many species now that are on the point of extin extinction. And again, due to exploration from humans, deforestation and climate change in itself, and we're seeing declines mm -hmm. in many most species at the moment uh, on, a, on, a, on a level that's never been seen since records began. And some of these figures are quite astonishing. You know, decline of 70% of, of, of species um, in the last 50 years is, is significant. And again, quoting from um, the Quran and Hadith is, you know, the animals themselves have their own communities, just like us. You know, there was, there was talk of um, a great care for, for elephants. He rescued many elephants uh, from Iraq before the war started there. And when he passed away, elephants travel for miles, up to 12 miles uh, to pay homage and pay their respects. You know, these are animals that have communities within themselves and, and obviously have have feelings themselves and it's something that we have to we have to be very mindful of but unfortunately they're explored they're hunted they're killed for you know next to nothing profit um and and it is it is really a calamity uh, that is upon us at the moment not to be taken lightly these figures are real again they're not they're not made up you can see them for yourselves if you look them up there uh, wwf is a great source for this kind of information and then air pollution this is something that we're working very closely with uh, on behalf of Network Rail within uh, a lot of the stations due to diesel exhaust emissions from train locals and the nitrous oxide levels that they, they emit, particularly within our more enclosed stations. And we're working very closely with a lot of specialists around. Oh, sorry, sorry it's, it's me again, yeah. but I don't know if it's me, but I keep seeing this the redacted black bar come across the top of your screen. If you can unshare and share again, it might disappear. Or if you can move what they are, it's like pop up screens, but we can't see. It just redacts your presentation. It's just taken away from your great presentation. One second. Yeah, if you can close all these pop-ups or whatever they are. So um Should I just yeah. stop sharing and share again? Yeah, if you stop sharing and sharing again, it might help. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Give me one second. Is it still there? Yeah, the bars are still there. So I was wondering what they are, but it's fine. Carry on anyway. Sorry about that. It's all right. Okay, in terms of uh, so far air quality, so air quality and air pollution, again, a huge issue, man-made issue. Um, and, and again, closely linked, similar to, to the way food consumption is, um, to many premature deaths. In the UK, there's many medical reports that talk about uh, up to 40,000 deaths a year, premature deaths within the UK due to poor air quality and air pollution. We've seen it high levels of asthma within children um, and, and many issues around a heart disease and strokes that's linked to poor air quality. Um, again, all man-made issues around industrial processes, vehicle fumes is a big one. Um, and that's why we've seen the advent of clean air zones being, being introduced now within all the main cities. Um, but again, huge issue around our health and well-being and climate change. So I've given a lot of 
doom and gloom in the first part of the presentation, but there, there is some hope. There's a lot going on um, around legislation, regulation, um, and changing ways and practices around being more sustainable and trying to target some of these main issues I've highlighted. Um, and we're seeing, we're seeing definitely uh, numbers in when it comes to carbon emissions being reduced to so something like you know, 45% lower in 1990 today than, uh, than they were in 1990, sorry. Um, and we've seen a big decrease in, in carbon. Um, and it, the trend is looking good due to the mix of renewables that are coming online when it comes to generation for our electricity. Um, there's a lot more wind farms out there, solar farms going online, and we're shutting down a lot of our dirty coal uh, power stations, uh, which is all positive news. Um, however, transport, and I'm going to focus on transport being the Muslims in rail uh, events, but transport still remains the largest source of carbon emissions within the UK, certainly um, accounting for just over th just under 35 percent. I was in pre-pandemic um, era as well. And something very, very, very um, important and, and was quite a milestone was the uh, Paris Climate Agreement in 2015. And that created some first of a kind for 20 years since the Kyoto Protocol, some commitments binding in trying to limit the effects of climate change. Um, and how that was done was to take action with all global countries to try to keep global warming below two degrees. So that does mean there's still going to be impacts. This, we're still going to see uh, you know, degradation in terms of big floods um, and, and landslides, et cetera. But we need to try and limit that. There's, there's an acknowledgement that there is going to be some change because of everything that's going on, but try to limit it below 20 degrees and make every effort we can to keep it below one and a half. Um, and the reason why, obviously, we need to make these commitments because, unfortunately, it's the poorer countries that suffer. We see, you know, what we're going to see going forward, lots more flooding in, in vulnerable countries like Bangladesh um, and certain, certain areas around India as well. Pakistan's prone to this as well. Uh, and we owe it to our future generations. And that's one of the big highlights of anything to take away today is if we can't do this for ourselves, at least make some sort of change for our future generations to come, because they will be the ones that really suffer. And so will all our animal kingdom, plants and animals. And we owe it to our species, as, 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 a, as I'll come on to, the reason why, from a faith point of view, why we need to do this as well, because we will be accountable for this. And again, unfortunately, some of the other figures around uh, contributions to greenhouse gas and carbon emissions, buildings and infrastructure have a massive amount of contribution towards this. And we are continuing to, to build for developers on this call as well. And I don't want to take away from people that are developing and building buildings. We're all involved, many of us around infrastructure and buildings, including myself. But it's how we can do things differently to try to reduce this number of its contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. It used to be a 50% figure a few years ago. So it is, it is on the downward trend. Um, and I'll show you why with the case study that I was closely involved with uh, over the past nearly six to seven years, which is a rebuilding of one of uh, Network Rail's biggest stations, New Street Station in the heart of Birmingham, built originally in the 1850s, used to be the biggest iron steel structure in the world at the time, that's seen on the uh, uh, bottom uh, figure there. Um, and it was then rebuilt after the war, and since then, up until 2008-9, it had not really changed, and everything else was changing around it. So you can see, like with many of Network Rail's mining stations, a big footprint in the centre of the city, 12 subsurface platforms in this case. Um, and a huge area that the footprint that it takes up in the heart of the city and quite a blocker towards redevelopment and regeneration. To the south, you can see quite a rundown areas um, that require regeneration to the north is more affluent and the station was seen as a blocker to do that. And rail is quite strategic when it comes to tackling actually carbon emissions, air quality uh, as well, because it is quite a green form of energy. And just before the pandemic, we were coming up to 5 million passengers, uh, passenger journeys a day using the rail network. Uh, numbers are double since the mid 90s they're set to double again over the next 15 years or so um so it is a huge you know obviously part of people's transportation uh, and obviously not just for passengers but for freight as well it was and during the pandemic as well rail was a great lifeline for take managing and moving materials and stock um to where it was needed most Going back to the station though, in the six, you know, as I mentioned, the station in Birmingham had not changed since the 60s. There's a real eyesore for passengers, commuters, and locals alike. Um, and it was just doing the wrong impression. And when we started this work, really thought about sustainability quite hard. I was very fortunate to be given a, um, a piece of work to manage the sustainability, but also from an engineering perspective, as a project engineer, to really have an influence in how we also built, demolish, um, and erected through some of these structures. Um, and to a tune of 42,000 tonnes of waste was removed as part of the demolition of this project. And 98 to 98.5% 98 
was avoided from landfill of the materials. And that's quite an achievement. And the only way that was achieved from, from us engaging very early on into the team with the planners um, to work closely with the supply chain to see where this waste would go. In this case, this waste was going to a place in Meriden, 20 miles away. And we even followed some of the lorries to make sure that they're actually recycling and doing what they said they'd do. A lot of the concrete was crushed for aggregate and rebar reinforcement bar was removed for recycling. We also, for the first of its kind for Never Rail, looked at prefabrication techniques where whole items of pipe work and cabling, et cetera, would be assembled off site and brought in on site on big wagons and, and bolted together basically. And that reduces an awful amount of waste as well. And there's a video I'm going to show very shortly on this. Um, but some of the structures, the best thing to do is if you're going to redevelop, don't knock it down, rebuild what you can. And when it comes to carbon and sustainability, not easy thing to do. We have new structure versus old, lots of testing and lots of surveys to be done to check the structure can last another 60 years. Don't get this as a 60 structure. And lots of um, uh, very well planned demolition that needed to take place. Below here was a live operational station. Um, so it's quite difficult to do um, enjoy the, the risk assessments for this were on, a, on another level. And in the end, what was created after a five year construction program and 750 million pound worth of, of government money spent was a brand new state of the art station, four times the size it used to be, a lot bigger even than London Euston now, uh, with natural daylight coming in via new atrium, lots of retail spaces and fancy cafes, um, lots of connect connectivity that wasn't there before. Um, to and, and enhance platforms to create a new station for the future. However, to do something on this scale, we had to do it sustainably. And when you approach sustainability, the main items and that we come to, um, and the approach is to follow what we call a triple bottom line or three pillars. Um, and that is to make sure there's an economic case for anything we do, positive environmental impact. And the third class often missed is a social responsibility. And again, more important for, for, for people within um, diverse communities to really focus on this point because a third pillar of sustainability, the social aspects has a big focus on diversity, quality um, and equal opportunities as well as looking at fuel poverty and effects of climate change on the social side of things. I've had a fourth dimension there, legislation, um, because governments can really influence um, how we build and how we become more sustainable um, due, due, to, due to standards that the issue and, and Network Rail can do the same as well. In terms of the station itself, uh, as I mentioned, it was we were building a station four times the size it used to be, and to get become compliant with all today's disability requirements and regulations, it needed to connect greater uh, for, for all types of, of passengers and commuters uh, to give everyone equal equal chance, no matter you know what, what any disability was. And that meant creating 28 new lifts, uh, the 28 escalators, 31 new lifts, we're doubling the demand of what it was before. And from a personal point of view, that did not sit easy with me in terms of carbon and sustainable developments in respect of we, you'd have our name on a development that was really state of the art, really nice for the city, but it would then be consuming so much more energy and energy means obviously contribution to carbon. Carbon is contributing towards climate change. So there is, there was an impact in that, just didn't sit easy with me. At the same time, during this project from 2008 onwards, we were involved. The culture was very much different to what it is today. It was very much reactionary. You know, oh, what you, what we we came into really senior level teams, and we were we were told, oh, why are you create more more complex complexity to already complicated project? Um, and it's very like, oh, do we really have to do this? Do we really have to look at low carbon technology? You know, we're up against a tight deadline. Luckily for us, HQ and Network Rail were developing new strategies, which we played a part in as well, and we helped develop them by becoming you know, stating by a standards point of view to be more energy efficient and, and low carbon as well. So what did we do? We, we, we created a really low carbon design. We modeled this whole building to use natural ventilation where possible. And we did a low carbon study quite early on. And I'll show you a short video about what we did around that. It was the first station to rainwater, to use all this rainwater from the roof to, for harvesting, to flushing all the toilets to tune about 60% demand of the toilet flushing was from harvested rainwater. When you look at the figures of into that station that's a significant amount of water that's being saved at the moment and again all from the all from the work that we did early on so to try and influence the design process influence our stakeholders and um, to create these first of a kind initiatives and not just the, the design uh, but also during the five-year build we were the first to start monitoring all our carbon from machinery and uh, we come up with a process where we're, we're brought in 10 miles outside of the city and then brought in uh, via via wagons the bottom left picture there via rail and that reduced around 10 to 12,000 lorry journeys through the five year program. Um, so big, it's prevented lots of big articulated dirty lorries coming in and out of a busy city centre. And all the timber was legally and responsibly sourced as well. 
We followed a methodology called BRIAM, won't go too much into detail, but it's a building research establishment environment assessment method. This sets a benchmark of how sustainable your development science is. It's a worldwide wide, renowned methodology and accreditation, and it was the first of its kind for Network Rail, but it covers many different aspects of sustainability in your design. And then it all goes into a calculator, um, and you get a number of credits you paste on, on each category. That's all evidence. So you log all the evidence, whether that be pictures, uh, certificates, etc. And then an assessor comes and scores this, and you get a score of either pass, good, very good, excellent, and outstanding as well. And, and throughout these different factors and categories, we did considerably well from the early outset. So as I mentioned, that we monitored carbon within the process of construction. We commissioned uh, uh, the building through from 12 months on, uh, from this first commissioning and 12 months after as well. We had learning reasons what was being done from a sustainability view, point of view. We the first station to have full LED with close control, dialing control lighting. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we modeled the whole building as well to make sure we'd minimize uh, mechanical ventilation and air conditioning. We created 160 cycling facilities, uh, and, and I mentioned rainwater, recycling rainwater. I'll talk about materials in a second. I've already talked about waste. Um, but also when it comes to biodiversity, within a, a concrete jungle like the center of Birmingham, most cities are, we actually created some really green spaces with, in this case, we did a green wall that's 325 square meters with 25 different plant species, really well received by the city. And it increases our biodiversity for diminishing species. You know, we don't see, we're seeing really falling numbers of bees, et cetera. And, and, and products like this and systems like this would, would, would help enhance our biodiversity around our main cities. And then on top of that, we locally saw, we, we created quite a unique power system, which I'll show, show you very shortly in a video of how we reduce carbon from the energy um, that we needed to create. And Network Rail is a big consumer of energy to the tune of about 500 million pound a year. It's one of the biggest, uh, if point, the biggest user of energy, mostly traction energy uh, compared to non-traction, which is our stations, depots and offices. But they are not set targets, even in Network Rail. The country as a whole has a legal obligation uh, under the Climate Change Act 2008 to become net zero by 2050. It's a legally binding agreement, um, and we really have to achieve this. And Network Rail, being a public body, um, has that commitment as well. And therefore, we're on this quest now to decarbonize. A new street station was seen at the forefront five years ago um, in helping towards low carbon developments. I'm now going to show you, I think, a very short video. Hopefully this will work. You can hear it okay, but if you don't, have to please shout. And um, this tells a bit more about how the energy, low carbon energy means were met um, in the station. We're now on the roof of Birmingham New Street Station. It's a 750 million pound redevelopment. The plan is to extend the concourse three and a half times the size it used to be. There's 31 new escalators, 28 additional lifts, and that all increases the energy requirement. And therefore, we had to look at new ways of producing energy for the station, low carbon energy. This whole CHP scheme combined into power scheme has been the first for network rail on a managed station. We're generating our own power from a 1.6 megawatt electric engine sited on the roof of this station and the byproduct of that generation process, the hot water that will come out of that at 90 degrees, will be pumped into an array of pipe work that will provide heat and hot water to different parts of the station and also to different parts of the city. There were many challenges as part of this scheme. We had to complete the design in a really short space of time and we had to use, use some unique and really innovative ways of manufacturing and producing the array of pipe work, which is just under a kilometre. Benji Bailey's off-site manufacturing process really assisted in compressing that timescale and the stringent programme that we had. And it's allowed us to make the business case work because in one, it's, there's less people on site, there's less issues with health and safety, less issues in terms of logistics. So there was less work to do on site as well in terms of welding and joints, etc. less waste. And therefore, Benji Bailey's allowed us to make this a really low carbon and viable initiative for this whole scheme. As an engineer, I'm very proud to have been part of this project. We've had many challenges along the way, but it results tonight in the final modules being installed that will provide green, sustainable energy for the people of Birmingham for the next 35, 40 years.
Okay, so in, in just to round up in terms of the projects, um, Network Rail saw New Street and the work we did there uh, as a first of its kind of setting a new benchmark in respect of sustainable development. Um, and now we're working closely actually with the Houston redevelopment team as well uh, with the new station plan there um, in, and, and transfer all these lessons that we learned from Birmingham as well. And we're quite fortunate to win quite a few awards as well um, along the journey as well, which is always a great and a, a, a plus anyway. Um, and I mentioned high speed too as well. Um, so in, when it comes to rail, as I mentioned, rail is seen as a low carbon transport um, to the tune that if you look at a vehicle, you know, with a single passenger compared to rail, you know, it's 70 percent uh, reduction in carbon. Uh, if you've got, you know, if you're using railway compared to a single use passenger in a vehicle. And that's the reason why a lot of these new rail networks are planned and considered HS2. And I know it's unfortunate uh, for, for, for people that it might be affected by the route of the new line. Um, and some of, you know, it is going through some woodland as well. Uh, but there is a promise from HS2, we're working on some, some of this, is whatever's going to be removed, there, there, there'll be net positive gain when it comes to biodiversity. So there'll be new shrublands, there'll be new uh, watercourses, et cetera, created uh, from this uh, mag 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 huge project, really, um, and, and the biggest, actually, infrastructure projects of this kind in modern times for the UK in particular. Uh, built in two phases, first phase London to Birmingham, second phase Birmingham to Manchester via crew. Um, and you've got the leg as well for the east leg to Leeds as well, actually, I feel. So there's, um, it, that's, that's one of the reasons why um, this is happening and why rail is expanding so much. Because if you look at some of these figures, in 2017 alone, road traffic accounted for 91% of transport emissions. And I've not even mentioned some of the air quality issues that are created from vehicle transport, which I highlighted earlier on in the presentation. And, uh, you know, people are using a lot more cars than used to be. You know, 20 years ago, you see one car on the driveway. Now, every, every family member has a car. So car use has grown significantly and so too have the pollution levels with it and contribution towards greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so this needs to be curtailed and rails are seen as a way of freeing up the road network and creating a more low carbon sustainable form of transport as well. Um, one of the things we're working on at the moment is we've done a, a number of studies with Avanti Rail and Network Rail um, on achieving carbon neutral stations and infrastructure because even though railways are uh, a carbon uh, a low carbon form of transport stations could consume quite a lot of energy because of the size and scale of them. Um, and the fact many of these are very old listed buildings as well. So it's qu quite exciting projects going on at the moment that we're doing first of its kind. We're, we're currently looking at Stoke Station to create first of its kind solar carport system uh, that could cover the car parking spaces and, and cover, cover, cover the elements for the passengers, but generate power to a tune that it can be self-sufficient uh, station just from the solar carport scheme itself for all the power consumption throughout the year. Um, and nearly there in terms of this project work, but no, no idea when it comes to sustainability is too crazy. We shared many crazy ideas during some of our projects. A lot of my motivation when it comes to sustainability and general motivation in terms of our hard work and ethics comes from uh, my father's bottom right picture in the 1960s in Cheetham Hill, Manchester, uh, when he was a bus driver. Um, but I remember when you used to have a Datsun and we were kids and you'd pull up with the lights and turn the engine off more for economic purposes and serving fuel than, than, than carbon, because carbon was really an issue back then. Um, but I remember when you, in saying that, wouldn't it be great if a car could, could start, turn off by itself with the lights and switch on automatically when you're about to leave? Um, and now you see, some few decades after you used to say this, you know, we've got stop start technology. Um, and that saves about 10 to 15 percent of your fuel consumption. It's now become a standard for all new vehicles that have this. Um, but you know, amazing how some of our elders uh, could see could see some of these ideas um, early in their uh, lives. So, in terms of our faith in what what we should be doing and how it's reinforced by some of the quotes, I'm just going to so, some of the few that I've read myself as well. In in when it comes to stewardship within our faiths and. The fact that we are supposed to be stewards on the earth and the ground makes clear reference to this is that we are stewards and that's why we've been you know we have power over other other animals um on the earth but that doesn't mean that we we don't look after them we have to it's it's um it's there very clearly within the quran in respect to you know we have been being stewards on the earth um, and looking after everything on the earth as well they all have a right and how we're performing as, as god's stewards on the earth well i think facts speak for themselves and all the news that you see on, uh, at the moment is we're not doing very well. Uh, we've, got, we've had a magnitude of environmental disasters, many that you see in the news, some you don't even see. Certain events within Nigeria, for example, with oil spills that just kind of brushed under the carpet. Um, they don't hit, see headline news. Deforestation is, is still at its, at its maximum. 
uh, than it has been, despite loads of uh, uh, efforts to curtail this as well. Um, and the plastics, we're only just finding out the, the extent of plastics within our oceans um, and the effect it's having on animals. Now, you, you know, if you want to come away from meat and you want to go and fish, you've got seriously high mercury levels and you've also got potential plastics now as well being consumed um, by just eating fish alone. So it's becoming very problematic to even uh, look at alternatives in respect to your diet. Um, and it's very clear that we, we shouldn't be doing this. You know, there's chronic references and hadiths around not polluting the earth um, because it's, you know, it's been wholesomely set in order and that order is now being affected by human activity. And we're only now finding out how delicate this order is within, the, within this planet. Uh, just small shifts in temperature is creating huge issues around um, you know, adverse weather uh, that we've not seen on a scale before and the impact. I think we're only just touching the iceberg at the moment. Um, and also when it comes to waste, clear references about waste as well. And if you look at some of the facts around food waste alone in North America, you know, the equivalent of 39 million meter cubed of landfill space um, is, is horrendous. 193 million tons of greenhouse gases emitted. Um, you know, over 32 million hectares of wildlife habitat is lost to farmland um, to grown food that is not eaten. It's, some of these figures are just horrendous. Uh, and I know this, this states is probably a worse example, um, but you know, this, is, this, this is going on now within the Middle East as well. Um, with a lot of the oil, oil wealth countries, you know, it is, it is becoming a significant issue as well. Um, and it's something that we really need to think about of how we deal with our waste. And in terms of ethics, um, when we talk about um, stewardship uh, and, and, and humans being steward on Earth for, for all, our, all our animal kingdoms, um, the, the, the Khalifa back in when there was a caliphate, and there's a lot of negative connotations now around caliphates, unfortunately. Um, but there was a clear purpose from an environmental sustainability point of view of a caliphate that would be God's deputy on the earth to protect all of God's creation, not just humans. Um, and, and that was, for those that are obviously big fans at the moment, everyone's watching Ertegal, et cetera, you know, the last caliphate in terms of the Ottomans, they, they, they all had this in mind in respect to the animal kingdom and preservation of, of the animal kingdom and not to cut down uh, trees with, without a good cause. Um, you know, and to protect our animals and not to kill without a just cause. And that was really within the culture that we don't really know about at the moment. Um, and again, you know, clear references from the Prophet Sallam around planting trees um, and, and also in terms of resource efficiency. When we talk about waste, we don't just mean food waste, but even look at the amount of extent of clothing waste. You know, we're throwing out trainers that are absolutely fine to wear again. Um, and same with clothing as well, all because of fashion. And when it comes to resource efficiency, though, you know, there's no greater example than the Prophet Solomon, all our prophets, to be honest. Um, and, you know, there's clear narrations um, about the Prophet Solomon, you know, repairing issues, repairing sewing clothes. Um, and even when they had the means later on uh, to, to, you know, have new garments, etc., they wouldn't. Um, they, they were very resource efficient as well. And again, we need to take a lot away from that and not just from from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, give examples of Prophet Sallallahu who had great powers in terms of, you know, controlling the winds, the birds, and, 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 and had the jinn to hand as well. Um, but again, just the humbleness around the, the ant giving a warning because Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with, with his army was coming through the valley of the ants. And the ant said to the others, you know, be careful, the, the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is coming through. And, and when Sallallahu Alaihi could hear this, because he could hear and communicate with the animal kingdom, um, he, he became, you know, he, he, he became very mindful um, that he didn't want to harm animals, you know, and he, and he made a prayer about him keeping humble um, through, through God's creation. Um, and he remained very humble despite the power he, that he had and that he was given, um, but, you know, to, to rule as, as a king, but he still fasted. He still was very resource efficient um, with, with the way he conducted his life. But today things are very different. And again, one of the most prevalent hadiths that are come to my mind is the one about um, wealth. The, the Prophet Sallam could see the keys of the treasures of the earth and he knew that his Ummah would be, would be wealthy, um, even though the early Muslims were, were very poor. Um, but he, he, also, he knew this, but he also knew that the wealth is what would ruin the, the, the Ummah as well. And you can see that again today, oil, although it's in many things that it's running the earth at the moment, the planet in terms of from, from plastics to medical devices, to your packaging for your food and everything else, as well as powering vehicles and, and equipment, et cetera. Um, but it's also been a great trial and fit now as well for the Middle East as well. It's, and it's created a lot of issues when it comes to climate change, obviously the, the source of carbon, um, but also many wars and conflicts as well. And unfortunately, most of the oil today is from uh, many of the uh, Muslim nations, um, but. That doesn't mean that it's just wholly endorsed 
um, by uh, the Muslim leaders themselves. You know, there's been a lot of work from religious scholars to try and curtail our, our um, uh, sale of oil from such countries as well um, and look at renewables. And there is great steps being made by Saudi uh, and other Middle Eastern countries, the UAE, et cetera, in trying to decarbonize their whole infrastructure and really lead when it comes to use of renewable technology from hydrogen to solar, et cetera, and wind power. Um, so they are seeing real changes now in a shift away from the oil-based economy, which is great to see as well, but what predicted by the Prophet Salim in a lot of pieces around the, the, the oil wealth as well. Um, but unfortunately, when it comes to culture, and I'm talking about my own from Pakistani culture, a lot of weddings we've gone to, and, and, and I've been the same in the past when, when carbon wasn't an issue, and, and our love of, of cars, etc. cetera. Um, but, but unfortunately, the image that we're portraying is we just do not care about carbon and also from the community. And when we're talking about weddings now, what some of the when you talk about carbon footprints, no bigger than than an Asian wedding at the moment. Um, and I think it's been a great lesson with the pandemic, and and I think people have managed to do weddings even without any any events and just close family being there. And not only to say thousands, but if you look at some of the entourages now, um, to where it used to be, it's absolutely it's, it's significant amount. Um, of disruption and not just talking carbon but air quality but you compare that to a few decades ago um, 30 years ago is that picture there it's a Ford Orion actually used to have one of them cars um, and you'll see a very different story to what it used to be to the tune of now um, you put the carbon equivalent of just an entourage for weddings by 70% more than it used to be and if you look at the number of cars that people hire uh, for these entourages it's just it's just pretty significant and now times are changing. It's really for us to lead in respect to the image we create and having that thought around carbon, uh, air quality and noise as well and disruption. Um, I mean, from this picture alone, you can see poor cyclists going through an array of flares and revving supercars. Um, you know, again, we just have to be very mindful what what's not just about the reputation and impression. Um, but as I mentioned, there's a new dynamic to this now when it comes to air quality, pollution and carbon as well. And um, there are alternatives out there now, um, you know, if they want, there's, there's going to be fully electric supercars it's very soon. Um, so there will be alternatives if that's really what people want to do. Um, but it's something I'd be mindful of. I'm not even touched on the food aspect. Imagine a, a wedding without any, any meat in respect to try and reduce carbon and emissions. Um, I don't think you'd have anyone turning up. And again, this is all about mindset and culture. Um, but it never used to be like this. You know, there's clear laws. There was clear welfare for wildlife conservation uh, in, in previous Islamic communities. And they were very mindful about establishing zones for water courses and regulating meadows and forests, um, you know, so that they can actually go through dry periods in terms of our buildings. Um, if you look at some of the most, uh, you know, prolific empires with the Mughal Empire, got the Ottoman Empire, look at some of the engineering and architecture. It was all designed around being sustainable. If you look at some of the buildings within the Mughal Empire and Queen Akbar, uh, sorry, King Akbar's uh, palaces, for example, you know, they used to use water fountains and sprinkler type um, uh, gravity fed systems that could cool bedrooms and cool, cool rooms with smaller windows, larger thicker walls to prevent heat from entering during the day and release it at night. Um, and they had all these kind of you know, engineering uh, solutions, but with the mindset that you'd never be you'd never be totally comfortable during periods of really high temperature or heat during the summer. But you could you could actually you know cope with some uh, uh, level of, of uncomfort. And but today you know we we want everything to be absolutely on point when it comes to temperature um, and differentials around that. But a lot of the previous engineers and architects were very mindful of this and the fact they didn't have modern technology to use anyway, um, but it steered them towards more sustainable developments that get, actually principles are now coming back in use today. You know, use of high chimneys so that we could stack effects, called cooler air during the, during the, 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 the cooler nights in the Middle East. Um, and it would allow for a, a lower baseline temperature in the morning. So you'd have cooler air entering from high level um, and spread out down into the uh, occupied spaces below. Um, and that's how a lot of the designs were, were of uh, previous uh, developments within the Middle East. Um, however, it's, it is now coming back, uh, say, into fashion, but we've had the first what we call an eco mosque in Cambridge, probably, probably the most low carbon development or mosque in Europe at the, at the moment. Um, and this was very carefully designed, we kept an eye on this development actually, and there was a significant amount of thermal uh, analysis carried out, computational fluid dynamics, um, to try to remove the use of air conditioning and mechanical ventilation, so it could really use as minimal energy as possible, all LED lighting with close control, um, similar to what we did in New Street, is rainwater runoff is used for toilet flushing and garden irrigation, um, and it's designed to be really naturally ventilated, also a lot of natural daylight as well, um, quite, quite a unique achievement there, and 
this needs to now become the norm in the way we design our mosques and our prayer facilities as well uh, going forward. We really need to be seeing, I've mentioned some of the quotes from the Adidas and Quran, we, we have to be so mindful of the way we now live our lives and with the way we actually build our infrastructure with the mindset of being sustainable and leading by example. And I think I'm nearly up now to laugh with Q&A, but really that's, that's the end of the slide pack. And the last message is really uh, from Albert Einstein about expecting the same results uh, by doing the same thing over and over again. It's, it's just ins insanity. So the time now is for change and we, we have to embrace the change never going to be easy um, but the time is now and the communities and our Muslim communities as part of our faith uh, we have to create that change and we should be seen as leading in that change. I hope that was useful for everyone. Love a bit of Q&A so I just think just about on time I think from what we predicted. Perfect Azhar thank you very much um, for amazing presentation really informative you can tell how the topic is really relevant because there's so many amazing comments and loads of questions. So let me uh, share some comments with you. So where are we? Bear with me, everyone. So I've got lovely comments from people. I'll read them out in a second. So first question, Abda Hanif. Uh, what is your opinion on the new risk emerging with the new technology of face masks being explored by some talks where some of them used copper nanoparticles? What's the effect on the environment like? Yeah, that's a topic that's come up a few times within Network Rail as well, um, and how to create more more eco-friendly kind of masks. Um, I think, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it's become it was just such a an unpredicted event. There was no time to plan, um, and and yeah, unfortunately, we're seeing face masks now within uh, oceans being dumped, uh, with land as well. You know, you see them. I've seen them on the streets now. I've seen them on roads. Um, this, you know, and they're just obviously a lot of them have have plastics in them as well as the ones that you talk about with copper. Um, but I think with a lot of the train operating companies and I'm being explored by others, it's that balance between health risk and risk of capturing, um, you know, COVID and the environmental impact as if they can capture any, un, you know, used masks and, and make sure that there's a, a controlled, um, a, a controlled way of, of the waste uh, and see if it can be recycled. I mean, I don't know what their plan is to be honest, but, and that's something that should be raised with them in respect to what is the end of life use and and what is the controlled disposal um, of the ones that will have any copper components, et cetera. Can it be recycled? Copper is not cheap. If they can extrapolate it, then they can probably get a business case around its recycling as well. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I was hard for answering that. Now, the next question is from Hassan Ahmed. Um, you mentioned the passenger numbers are set to double in the coming years. Do you think that will still be the case in post-COVID economy? And do you think the rail transportation can be viable substitute to road motor vehicle transport? Yeah, I think um, once I think life becomes back to normal, um, I definitely think uh, rail use will, will be back up again. Um, I think we've seen um, some snippets of this in Australia, I think, um, where I know they've not had the extent we, we have uh, in respect to the pandemic, but they have seen a, a back in increase in numbers uh, from, from the use uh, of rail uh, and passenger numbers are, are back up again. So if that's anything to reflect on, then I think we will see an increase in that. But I think people are just sick of being stuck in traffic all the time. And I think the way we're designing a lot of our rail infrastructure is to connect to other modes of transport. And that is to the success of a low carbon transport uh, in any country really, is can we connect to cycle facilities to get into maybe electric vehicles or have electric charging points at the station, car parks and make it available to all. Um, so that if they do need a car, they can get to a station quite easily in the vehicle and they can have it electric charged during their journey. When they come back, it's full charge and they're away again without emitting too much pollution as well. Um, so it needs to be a fully encompassed uh, transport mode connected to other modes of transport like light rail, for example. We've seen a lot of tram, tram uh, extent of light rail tram systems now connected to main stations like at Manchester, for example. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, next one's kind of linked, actually, because how uh, a question from Adil Majid. Uh, how much of an impact will working from home have on achieving the 25% reduction target? The network rail 25% reduction for CP6. Um, yeah. yeah. I think it will have, not just because of working from home for any network rail or rail staff, but actually as, as a whole, stations have had a huge reduction in actually energy consumption and so traction because there's been some reduced services. Um, so although trains are still running, um, there, there has been a big reduction. Now, uh, that will probably contribute towards a reduction. We'll probably smash the 25%, to be honest. Um, so that's, that is... 
and it's maybe you know many many can argue that this is a, a bit of a check it's nature's way of telling you know us that you know, we um, because there used to be a lot of talk around, we, you know, we need to spend billions um, to change our ways and become sustainable. Well, we've done that anyway. You know, the government spent over 300 billion to keep people at home. Um, it can be done. Obviously, we didn't do it because of the pandemic, but we can change our ways. And this this has shown really nature's way um, that we've got to really change in the way we, we, we behave, the way we travel and the way we work. Thank you very much. Um, I think we lost you a little bit on the answer. We've got a bit, a bit of a glitch in the connection, but I hope we can still have you oh, the rest of the. That's fine. Um, I think I've got the last question here. Uh, um, HS2 is destroying, this is from Fuad Ali, HS2 is destroying a lot of the irreplaceable ecological history. Is there anything spiritual that we can reflect on? Yeah, it's very difficult one because, um, as I mentioned, some of the figures around road transport and its carbon, when you look at the contribution of transport, significant that on a global scale it's killing more than what anything what hs2 would would um, affect and that's not to justify um, any any removal of historical um just you know uh, woodland which, which is the issue here um but when you have to look at this i think on a more macro scale that the emissions whole life emissions that will be reduced from hs2 will will have a huge impact on global eco ecology systems not just local and national for, for the UK. Um, so it is unfortunate. I, I know HS2 have tried their best to, to not go through some of these woodland areas, but I think there's only two triple SIs, which are, which are classed as strategic um, importance, ecological importance. Um, but as I mentioned, they have committed to put back more than what's being destroyed. And that, that promise is there. Um, they are going to be held to account under the HS2 Act. Um, so the, the new railway act. Um, so they will be held to account for this and you, you can track and trace because they've got a system of identifying exactly what's being put back in and what's been taken out. Excellent. Um, thank you, Azhar. Um, we have five minutes left. I think we've run out of I, uh, time for questions. Um, thank you for all your comments and questions, everyone. Sorry, I couldn't read all of them. just want to read some of the comments. Um, so it's from your presentation, Saba says, we agree we need to increase the awareness of halal organic free range meat to make it more accessible. Adil adds that a few years ago, there was a struggle to find organic halal chicken, but now there's a lot of options available. Um, Hassan adds 12,000 gallons of water uh, and up to nine kilograms of grain to produce one pound of meat. And that's, you know, to put the context of, you know, what is what you need to do to produce that. Um, and just to add to that, I think yeah. it's, it, it absolutely agree. There is options out there. I mean, I, even I've got, you know, close friend who's, who's uh, producing some, you know, really good day of halal products right from the outset. Because even the feed that you, you feed these, you know, some, some of the stories are horrendous on the feed of some of these animals and what they're pumping with in terms of sodium. And now you've got chlorine washing from the US of chickens. Um, so there is absolutely there's options out there that weren't there, you know, a few years ago. Um, and that's the difference now. We have options when it comes to day of food, when it comes to alternative means of transport. We've got hybrid vehicles, we've got electric vehicles. You know, there's, there's a whole host of options out there now. Yeah, excellent. Hi, Akta. Sorry, yeah. Nadim Bashir. Just a question on that. Obviously, uh, regarding uh, the organic poultry side of things, there's a big price difference between what you buy in a standard shop, which is typically about £4 for a chicken, compared to organic chicken, which is circa £10 plus. Pounds. Yeah. Is, is it, you know, obviously, that is going to heavily influence whether people shift to a more sustainable long-term solution and how, how do we get people you know how do you do it yourself because obviously if you live, live in a relatively large family then you know if you're gonna obviously with the you know obviously fasting around the corner and even with Eid you're not going to necessarily be you know investing you know 10 12 15 pounds in a chicken when you've got a large family to feed which is a reality I suppose of the modern world yeah, and, and to be honest, now we order a lot of organic, you know, we, we do feel that pinch, and I'll be honest with you, but when you look at the long-term health implications of not doing this, and when you actually look into some of these programs that you can find online, there's so many now, even on Netflix, around what is going on in factory farming, mm. the more we can, with the more we all get together and buy organic, the cheaper it will become, first of all. Um, but also your health in, your health has to come first. And what, what we're finding is people do feel a bit of pain. They're thinking, oh, I'm paying twice as much. 
But then actually, when you look at all the money that we waste on other stuff, no. um, you, know, you look at subscriptions on fees, uh, you know, yeah. you, we, there's ways we can probably adjust and prioritise. I, I agree. The quality is, is, is uh, sort of a, a big difference because I have purchased organic uh, from a halal supplier and it's, the taste quality is amazing. It's different. Yeah, it, 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 it's definitely you know noticeable. Thanks, Nadine, for your um, yeah. valuable input. Yeah. Appreciate it. I'm just conscious that we're running out of time. We've got a couple of more comments coming in. Uh, everyone's throwing in their questions now. A <laughs> uh, uh, couple of more comments, as I mentioned. Rukrana Yakub says, "Mashallah, a very uh, brilliant, uplifting presentation. It's fantastic to see Muslims make a really valuable input into UK life." And added to that, Amir says, um, uh, "You know, it's great to see such strategic, high-level input from Azhar and his team, making a difference to future generations." I've um, got time for one more question. That's coming from our uh, sustainability manager, uh, Gerardo Australia, Austria. Sorry, Gerardo Austria. Fantastic presentation, Azhar. Congratulations. What's your view on population growth as most mitigation measures? towards environmental degradation is resource water energy materials food etc efficiency yeah that's that's, that's a good question because um in in our room it's always we're always told to uh to expand and grow our families and have and have children and not worry worry about uh, things but but it's, it's the case of your consumption per capita so at the moment you know if we're consuming if each if each child is consuming i don't know let's say 100 grams of carbon a week to keep you know keep them fed and everything else it's how you can reduce that per capita. So per child, per adult, if we can reduce our carbon footprint, then we can have more sustainable uh, expansion, population growth. Um, and, and that's really the key, is, is making changes to your own family structure and how you run and operate your homes, how you heat, how you, how you move around in your vehicles, how you eat your food and sourcing the food and materials and waste and recycling. If, if you make them changes, there's no reason why you can't expand your families and have a slightly increased population. Excellent. Thank you very much, Azhar, for that. And that is our last question. We've got one minute left. I would like to quickly summarise. Azhar, thank you very much for this inf insightful talk. Uh, you can tell from the level of engagement, the questions, it was amazing and it was really interesting and um, really prevalent. I was really impressed with your involvement in the Birmingham New Street Station project, something I would have loved to be involved in if I had the opportunity. Um, I also loved the personal aspect that you in included in your um, presentation, uh, referring to your father's Datsun. Um, you know, my dad had a Datsun too back in the day. And I think you should have patented the idea of start stop because your dad, <laughs> yeah. your dad was the pioneer. Um, Further, I can relate to the carbon footprint about weddings. Uh, sadly, I contributed a little bit to that myself. I travelled from London to Birmingham with two limousines and a coach. So it wasn't too bad. But it was not, not coach as is much fine. Coach <laughs> is fine. You carry uh, a lot of people. Uh, and I think, that isn't a dig at anyone because we've been there. We've done that in our own family. So it's not a dig. It's more about going forward, how we can we change it. I <laughs> uh, appreciate it. And I think you also included the picture from uh, our Muslims in Real uh, Ashura chair member, uh, uh, Nasir Khan's uh, wedding photo with the Ford <laughs> Orion with the flowers on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was most taken aback by the um, Muslim obligation to sustainability. Some of us don't realize we're doing it. Some of us don't realize we need to do it. And it's been a great reminder. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you, people in the background, Nasir Khan. Thank you for uh, being the gatekeeper and uh, sorting out the uh, admin on the Q&As. Uh, and last but not least, thank you everyone who's joined this webinar this afternoon. It's been short and sweet. If you'd like to find out more about our events, please visit the Muslims in Rail website at www.muslimsinrail.org. Uh, I know Azar has his hand up. You have your hand Sorry, up. Sorry, just right? a quick one. I'm getting lots of messages are saying, is this been recorded and can they re can it oh, be replayed? So, so those who joined late, uh, I did say that this, this, is, this, is been, this definitely has been recorded and it will be available on the Muslims in Rail YouTube website. Um, People have asked for the presentation. Can we get a copy of the presentation or is it uh, IP? Um, yeah, I probably can. I probably, um, I'll just stop. And there, is, there was a question about your video, the Network Row video for the Birmingham New Street Station. Is that available publicly? Yeah, I think that's on a YouTube uh, link as well, actually. Excellent. I'm not, I'm not a big too. YouTuber, but I think I've got that <laughs> on my YouTube please, channel. Please do share that. So um, I'd like to now draw this webinar to a close. I look forward to seeing you all at our next event. Thank you very much. Uh, goodbye. Um, peace and blessings be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Um.